All right. So for anyone um, tuning in later, just so you know who you're, who you're talking with today, um, my name is Diana Imundi. And Joanna for Georgia is also with us, both from AAA Northeast. We work at uh, the AAA headquarters building in Providence, Rhode Island. And we um, have, you know, through the, the course of probably the last 18 months, have received a lot of questions about Real ID and how to obtain Real ID. Um, especially now that COVID-19 has kind of changed the, 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 uh, the process just a bit for both the DMV and for AAA to be able to issue these. The good news is that the federal government did push off the deadline to October of 2021. So previously, everyone was kind of rushing to get their real ID for October 1st of, of this year. Um, but with so many disruptions in service, um, the Department of Homeland Security did approve um, to, to push that off for one year exactly. So we can get started. And Joanna, if you don't mind going to the next slide. There we go. Okay. So we do get a lot of questions on really what is Real ID and how did it come to be? And I, I just want to remind everyone that Real ID was established as an act by Congress back in 2005. This was actually the result of 9-11 and the formation of the Department of Homeland Security. Um, so this was just something to establish a mandate met by all 50 states. So those states issuing um, identification did so in a very streamlined manner where all states had to meet minimum requirements. So it was kind of an anti-terrorism action. So we got a lot of questions about, you know, why is the governor doing this? Has nothing to do with the state of Rhode Island, nothing to do with our local government. This is a federal act. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's interesting because there is a little bit of confusion still. And I think the reason is each of the 50 states was kind of allowed to roll out the, 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 the mandate, the Real ID mandate, kind of along their own timeline. So some states were doing this before others. For example, Massachusetts started at least a good year before Rhode Island started issuing Real ID identification. But now we all are up and running. We're able to do this. Like I mentioned, um, we are able to issue these through our AAA branch offices in most cases. And um, of course, the, the the DMV is issuing these as well. So the big changes you can see from the, the picture here, there's a gold star on, um, on this, and we'll, we'll kind of go over what the driver's license looked like pre-real ID and post. This is, this is a real ID document. You can tell by that gold star. But now all, all 50 states have to have digitized photos and the individual's full legal name has to appear on the document as well as their date of birth, their signature. So you can see in that bottom left corner, you can actually see a writing sample and their permanent place of residence. And we do get a lot of questions like, what if you have um, you know, two homes in two different states, whatever you are claiming as your permanent residence, um, basically the same address that you would put on your tax documents should appear on your real ID document. So you can go forward, Joanna. Okay, so one of the things that we have to remember, and this is for everyone, okay, is that once we have that, that deadline come upon us of October 1st, 2021, if you don't have other identification such as a passport, you will need a real ID driver license credential to be able to board aircraft in the US. That uh, TSA is enforcing that. You also will need to show a real ID document to enter certain federal buildings like nuclear power plants. Um, an example locally of that would be like the Raytheon buildings, um, federal court buildings, things like that. So it is a document that they will be looking for when you enter these uh, secured facilities. 
And I think we can go on because I'm going to show you a picture one more time of, of what it looks like. So the images on the left are the real ID credentials with that gold star. And the one on the right is what the standard Rhode Island driver's license looked like before this. Okay. So one of the things, you know, we don't want people to panic or stress about it. All right. If you don't typically fly domestically and you don't have plans where you need to enter a federal building, a secured building, you don't have to rush and stress out to get the real ID. If you are flying though, or if you're flying, of course, internationally, you do need to have a valid passport, not an expired passport, but a valid passport. Um, just as a side note, it's great if you do have a passport, um, when you are obtaining real ID, that's just kind of, it's almost like the gold standard document. If you have a passport, you can avoid having to produce a lot of other paperwork. So it's, it's nice to have. You can go on to the next one, Joanna. All right, so this is actually a full list of what you can use to fly if you do not have a real ID document, okay? So you, like it says, you may use a, not, a valid non-expired proof of identification from the list below. So these are good examples, um, a global entry card, US Department of Defense ID, um, permanent resident card, border crossing card. So those are all federally recognized and federally issued documents, okay? And we did add a link within the chat here. So if you wanted to review the list of documents that you'll need to have handy to prepare to convert to a real ID, you'll have that handy. And the one piece of advice that I, I have to give you is don't try to divert at all from the list that we're supplying. It's actually issued by the Department um, of Transportation. I'm sorry, the, the DMV. So um, Department of Motor Vehicles. So they're the ones that issue that list and we really cannot diverge from that list at all. Okay, we can go to the next one. All right, so think of it this way. Um, this is kind of a puzzle that, that you're going to gather all these documents ahead of time. Remember that all the documents that you bring to the DMV or to the AAA office to get the real ID have to be original documents. They don't accept any photocopies. So the first is your proof of identity. So this one's easy. If you are getting your, um, if you have a valid driver's license, you can use that as your proof of identity. Super easy, right? Even better, if you have a passport and a non-expired passport, you can use your passport as proof of identity. Really, really easy. The second one is proof of social security. The easiest form would be your actual social security card. If you don't, if you've misplaced it for any reason, there are some substitutes um, like tax documents and things like that that you can use um, it, you know, without the, your social security card. And that's on the list that I was just referencing. But if you have that, that's the best thing that you could possibly bring. And then proof of residency. So you have to show that you're living in the place um, that's referenced, let's say it's on your driver's license, okay? You have to show that that's where you're living. So that's where things like a utility bill um, or a, um, so let's say auto insurance policy with your, or homeowner's policy, anything like that with your full address on it, that will suffice for a proof of residency. Okay, so we can skip to the next one. So these are um, just examples, common proof of identity, okay? So like I mentioned, US passport, an original birth certificate, it would need to either be issued by the Department of Health or by your city or town, okay? It, it does have to be the original, again, cannot be a photocopy. And, um, you know, most people, I feel like they, they've got something around the house but you just have to make sure we're, I'm gonna show you on the next slide, what a lot of people are making the mistake of bringing, which we call the Gerber baby birth certificates. That is what um, a lot of folks were sent home with from the hospital, especially those 
probably born between like 19 and like 1930s through the 1960s. Okay. And even though it says state of Rhode Island division of vital statistics on it, those cannot be used. I'm so sorry. So if you can go back just one slide, Joanna. Okay. Um, so the, the last one here, right. Consular report of birth abroad issued by the United States. So a foreign consulate can issue those, right? But it would it would have to be you know issued here in the United States. So those are the document numbers there at the bottom. So it's an FS two forty DS thirteen fifty or an FS five forty five. If you want to jot those down for anyone um, born outside. Okay, then you can skip over. Great. Okay, this is the one that is the most challenging for, especially for the ladies. <laughs> this gets tricky. So since for ladies who change their last names to their husband's last names, we need to show all name changes. So let's say you're brought home from the hospital. My name is Diana Imundi. That was my given name at birth. That's my maiden name, okay? If you, though, have been married and changed your name, you need to show through an, a, a vital statistic record the certificate from the marriage that changed the name, okay? If that happened and then you change that maiden name, okay, you're probably safe if it matches your birth certificate. But if there's no match, that's where you've got to show every single step of the way in terms of a name change. And again, I know it gets really tricky and it's not fair to the girls. The guys don't have to deal with this, but, um, but you do need to get that. So the place you can get those birth and marriage certificates if you don't have them handy is the Department of um, Health the, in the Vital Records Department, right on the first floor of that building. But I want to mention this, especially for people who were not married or born in the state of Rhode Island, who kind of transplanted here later, there's a really useful website and it's called vitalcheck.com, okay? So it's a little bit of a different spelling, but you can actually order all your identity documents, even if you do live in Rhode Island and you just don't feel like making that trip to the Department of Health, you can order them online, okay? So it's V-I-T-A-L-C-H-E-K, not C-K. So vital check, just with the K at the end, dot com. And I'll add that to the chat at the end for you. Um, but, but that will save us all who were not born or married here in the state or save us from not wanting to stand in line. <laughs> and we can skip ahead, thank you. Okay, the other big no-no that we see a lot, and of course, just so, so you know, we've developed this presentation based on what we see in our actual branches. So we're seeing a lot of people bringing a marriage certificate, but it's a church-issued certificate, not a state certificate-issued certificate. So unfortunately, even though the church would accept this, the state cannot. It's not, um, it doesn't qualify as a federal document. So you do need it from the Department of Health. Okay, next one. Great. So the other thing, like I mentioned, if you don't have your Social Security card handy, you can bring a couple other documents in place. So any letter issued by the Social Security Administration, even if it's just saying you're not able you're not eligible to receive a social security number here in the US, that's fine. Any letter showing you know, that connection will work. Also a 1099 form, as long as the 1099 had been issued within the last five years, that's, uh, that's an acceptable document to be using. Or a pay stub. So the, the pay stub would just have to have your full name and your full social security number on it, also issued within the last five years. So we just want to make sure we're seeing the social security number in those cases, and they can't read really, really old documents. Um, the other thing I, I should mention, here in Rhode Island, 
they will accept a laminated social security card. Just across the border in Massachusetts, they will not. So each state has their own little quirks and, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit different e in each place, but they will accept a laminated card. So you might be hearing rumors from people from, you know, other states saying, oh, no, you can't bring that. It's, it's okay here. We have approval to do that. Okay, we can go to the next one. Thank you. Um, the other thing we are seeing a lot is people bringing the stub from their Medicare cards. And unfortunately, that won't suffice. And we do need to see something with the social security number on it. It can't be the stub. And that is the way it's mailed to you, unfortunately. So a lot of people get confused because it's mailed that way. It's perforated. It tears away. Um, so just please don't bring that because we hate having to send people home for more documents. It's the worst. Okay, and then in terms of the, the common proof of residency, so I mentioned a utility bill is perfectly acceptable. As long as it has your name and your address on it, perfectly fine. Um, a homeowner's or renter's insurance policy, a lease agreement that's current, that's in effect, or even a personal check or bank statement. That's what I did personally when I converted to Real ID. I had my checkbook in my purse, and uh, all I really needed was my driver's license, my passport, because I, you know, I had both with me, my social security card, and I had my checkbook, and I had one utility bill. Easy. I was in and out pretty quickly. Um, I, I didn't, you know, personally have any issues with it, but it's definitely all about the preparation and making sure you have all these documents in order before you leave. Um, it is also a little bit tricky. So for people that use a PO box, instead of having mail mailed directly to their home, unfortunately, PO box addresses are not accepted. So we have to get creative there and use something else. Okay, we can go to the next one. Okay. So here are just some examples so you can see what those documents would look like. Okay, so there's a national grid bill. Great, insurance policy, the insurance binder, perfectly acceptable. We've got the check, great. Yep, all right. So we ask and beg, especially right now, guys, we do have a lot of changes to services. Um, going on in our branch offices as a result of COVID-19. So I know this is um, a pretty labor intensive process just to convert the driver's license to a real ID license. It's not as fast as a typical driver's license because we actually have to scan everything in to the DMV. Every document has to, to scan through perfectly and be completely legible for it to be accepted. Sometimes, like, for an example, uh, you know, I mentioned the laminated Social Security card. The reason why some states aren't accepting laminated documents are just because of that, because they don't scan as easily. There might be some glare um, that makes it illegible on their end at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, so we're definitely trying our best, but we can't move faster than those scanners are letting us. So just pack your patience. Um, and again, don't deviate from that checklist. We can skip ahead. And again, the deadline is now October 1st, 2021. One of the things we get a lot of questions about is, okay, what if my driver's license doesn't expire? until 2022. At that point, you kind of have to ask yourself, kind of weigh your options and say, all right, well, do I have any trips planned where I, I would need to fly between 2021 and 2022, okay? Um, would I need to get on a plane? In that case, if you do not have like a military ID or passport that's valid, something else in the list, yet my recommendation is actually gonna be go ahead in advance and just get it done if you will be needing it. You don't want to be in that stressful situation where you can't board a plane, especially in situations where, you know, a family emergency might pop up. If you do have family in other states, not in driving distance, it's just a good thing to have. Um, but if you can put it off, no one's forcing you to go get it by October 1st, 2021. The other thing that you do need to consider is the fact that 
when your normal cycle is for a license renewal as of now, you would go by that schedule. So just because you've converted to Real ID doesn't put you on a new schedule. So that's important to remember, okay? Um, when you obtain your Real ID during um, a, a normal license re renewal process, there's no additional fee. There, so it doesn't cost anything to get a Real ID. But if you convert it outside of that normal schedule, then there is a fee. And I'll go to that in, in just a second, but I, I need people to, to understand that. So the state ID typical renewal to update um, outside of that is 2750 state ID um, if you're under age 51 is 2750. If you're 51 years of age or older, there is no typical fee for a state ID renewal. Okay, so that's a little bit different. Okay, so license renewal, if you're under 71 in the state of Rhode Island is $62.50, and this has been updated within the last year, okay? If you're over 71, and the reason for this, it's, it's less money, it's 2450, because you do have to renew on a more frequent basis, right? So it's a five-year license if you're under 71, it's a two-year cycle if you're 71 and older. Um, and then to update to a real ID outside of that window of a normal um, license renewal is 2750. Okay, so in that scenario, let's say your normal driver's license doesn't expire till 2022, but you want to get the real ID in time for the, for the deadline, October 1st, 2021, you would have to spend the $27.50, right? But <laughs> so right now, under COVID-19 restrictions, we still are able, thankfully, to process real IDs at all our AAA branch offices in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts, um, but you do have to schedule an appointment. So typically, you know, under normal conditions, you'd be able to just kind of show up whenever it's convenient, stand in line and, and get it processed. Right now we're taking appointments for all our transactions because we are practicing social distancing. We only can have a certain amount of members in our branch offices at a time. We wanna make sure everybody's safe. So um, you do have to make a schedule, a scheduled appointment, and you can do that right on our website at AAA.com slash appointments. Um, I would definitely recommend, just keep in mind, you, you should do that 14 days in advance, okay? And once you're in the system, you will receive an email confirmation just to confirm your appointment. When you arrive at the branch office, um, don't forget to, to wear a mask. You, you are required to wear a mask in the branch, uh, just like everywhere else these days, right? And you'll just show them, here's my scheduled appointment. I have it. Um, you can print it. You can write it down. Um, you can show them on your phone if you have email connected to your phone. Um, but just to confirm that you are indeed um, scheduled for that appointment. Okay. So these are the times we're open for questions. What I will say is that you are welcome to email me um, any questions that you may have, okay? Um, my email address, we can put in the chat, but it's D-E-I-M-U-N-D-I, so D-E-I-M-O-N-D-I at aaa northeast.com forgive my very long email address i'll say it one more time um, it's d e i m o n d i at aaa northeast.com and we can kind of front load any questions that you might have so our branch managers are truly the experts because they're the ones that you know with their staff they process these all day long every single day they know just about every little nuance to this uh, process so if it's not a you know if it's a little bit of a trickier question and doesn't necessarily fall into the general Q and A that we do I can definitely you know call on our branch operations friends and get you the answer that you need. That's the one thing is I want everyone to feel comfortable and feel prepared before they go. Uh, so there's no question because it's, you know, it's, it's horribly frustrating 
for our members if they get there and they're missing a document and they've already driven and they've made that trip. So we want to eliminate that. And even if you know you do prefer, let's say the DMV is pretty close to your home and you want to process it there, we're more than happy, AAA member or not, to vet the documents for you and give you the advice that you'll need to get prepared even if you're gonna do the transaction at the Department of Motor Vehicles. We just want you to feel comfortable. Um, so again, I apologize to all the ladies that have had name changes because it's that one extra step for those folks. But um, I'll type my email into the chat here so everyone has it. Okay. There we go. And as you can see, the, the link to the dot list of documents uh, that the Department of Motor Vehicles produced is right there on the top. And uh, feel free to call us with anything. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. Did you have any questions? Uh, well, I have sort of a curiosity. I feel like you might have answered it, um, but you, when you were talking about name changes, you specifically yes. referred to uh, mostly people who changed their last name, but is it the same process if you have a different first name on your birth certificate? Then? Absolutely. And you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because we do see a lot of first name changes as well, or more commonly hyphenated, like first and middle. Mm -hmm. So it does make that little hyphen actually makes a difference. So if your birth certificate says Jean Marie, for example, with Thank the hyphen, but then your driver's license says Jean M, mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. That actually has to be corrected before we can process the real ID documents. Okay. So yeah, I've um, unfortunately coached a lot of people through that. And, um, you know, there was, an, I remember one woman in particular, and her name was Sarah Anna on her birth certificate. Her entire life, everyone called her Anna. She did not even know mm -hmm. that her legal name was Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> everything from, you know, her insurance documents, like everything, her all her old pay stubs, taxes, everything just said Anna. And she had to get the legal change before she could process it. And she was a person that enjoyed traveling. So yeah, yeah it can be a little bit tricky. It can, yeah. The first names are a strange thing sometimes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. But that's a great question. Thank oh, you thanks. for raising that. Yeah. <laughs>